Hello, and welcome to everyone out there. Thank you for joining. Um, welcome to episode two of Watson Farley's uh, Ship Owners webinar series. Um, uh, I'm joined today by uh, my fellow uh, capital markets and corporate partners in New York, Falana Silberberg and Steve Hollander. Um, our goal for this session of the, of the webinar series is to identify and discuss some topics that are of interest to shipping companies that are publicly listed, um, whether in New York or, or elsewhere. A lot of what we discuss will be relevant to any, any publicly listed company. Um, and also to companies that are uh, currently private and thinking of, uh, of a listing, of a public listing. So as we thought about um, uh, what we wanted to discuss, it occurred to us that the best way to get at these, these issues and questions would be to invite some of our um, uh, very experienced and accomplished clients and friends who have been at the middle of some of the most interesting and important transactions and issues for public companies. Um, so we've done that. Uh, joining us today are um, a few uh, names that I expect are familiar to, to everybody. Um, uh, first is Ted Young, uh, the Chief Financial Officer of Dorian LPG. Uh, next is uh, Anthony Argaropoulos, the founder of Seaborne Capital Advisors, uh, and also Tom Lister, uh, Chief Commercial Officer and Head of ESG at Global Ship Lease, although in a few days, um, I believe will be the Chief Executive Officer, CEO of of GSL. Um, so uh, the format is uh, going, we've, we've set it up as uh, three 15 to 20 minute one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with each of these. Uh, and we're going to kick it off with, um, oh, and you, you can, um, I hope it's clear, you can submit any questions that you'd like to ask uh, any of these panelists um, by using the Q&A button <clears throat> in, the, in the Zoom window. And we'll see those and uh, pick them up and answer them at the end of each session. Uh, so let's kick it off with, uh, with Ted Young. Um, I will be speaking to Ted Young. Ted, thank well, you for joining. Good to talk to you again. Always good to talk to you. Yes. So here we are um, in 2024. I realized actually just a minute ago that this, I think, is the 10th anniversary of Dorian's IPO, or it's, it's New York listing anyway. It's NYSE yep. listing. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so it's been some years. I was I was around for those initial steps. You were step for step with us. Uh, it was fun. Um, you know, and and uh, an, an odd thing about about Dorian's, you know, I, I said this about partly directed at companies that might be thinking about going public, and and an odd and and you know probably really favorable thing uh, was that before your IPO, you were raising lots of money in the in private placements. Um, you know, and and I wonder just briefly what were Dorian's drivers for for going public? I mean, companies take different paths to to a listing. Yeah, I think it was in our case uh, driven by a desire to well, a belief that we were entering um, a good time in the LPG shipping business. Uh, so if you dial back. <clears throat> Uh, you know, the, the advent of the U.S. fracking revolution was sort of 2010, 2011. And to your point, uh, we started raising money in 2013, which happened to coincide with a really slow time in the ship building markets. The yards had uh, very few orders. So we were able to uh, find that sort of sweet spot, that nexus between uh, capital markets interests and in our case, a good investment project at a good price um and that's you know usually you know the capital markets windows for shipping uh tend to open and close rather quickly and uh i think you were among the counselors who said rule number one of uh, of capital markets be ready uh and we were uh you know we we had gotten in we had we had hired you guys early on uh and worked together to you know we didn't have everything 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 set but we had a lot of things set um and the way we evolved was that we initially placed an order for three option three and the best way to do that uh, we weren't really we weren't you know we hadn't completed our corporate reorganization that we have now 
Um, and so the best way to do it was Oslo, where um, A, because we did it in the OTC market, the, the regulatory, there was no really regulatory oversight. Obviously, we had to make a number of representations and warranties to the investors, but it's sort of a very streamlined process. Um, so that worked well for us, but we very quickly um, reached an agreement with Scorpio Tankers to take over ultimately 13 new building contracts. And when the dust settled, and we also exercised those three earlier options. So when you looked at the entire scope of our new building program, it was about $1.4 billion. And we needed the better part of $700 million in equity to finance that. So that, was, that sort of outstrips the Oslo market. Um, and so we sort of quickly um, evolved towards looking at a full listing. But I'd also say investors wanted um, a full listing because the OTC is great, but it is not extremely liquid. Uh, a number of investors also have mandates that require them to invest only in listed companies. Uh, and the OTC does not count as an exchange. Um, you know, there's sort of different levels in Oslo that I've kind of forgotten now and they've evolved. But obviously going to New York. Uh, was also something that Scorpio wanted because they took shares. They wanted to have the optionality to distribute shares to their investors. We also had Secor when it was still public as an investor. They wanted the same optionality. So, um, you know, it was a great way to obviously finance the equity portion that we needed to do to finance, but also it met the needs of a number of our different uh, shareholder constituencies. And, uh, you know, again, it was the right time um, to, to, to go public. There was significant interest in sort of the, the picks and shovels opportunities of the fracking revolution. And uh, we were well prepared and well advised and, and able to, to, to execute well. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you lined up all those, all those different drivers um, and, you know, you got to go at a time of your choosing, um, not, not driven by, by investors. And yes, I mean, it's, it's, it takes a long time to get ready and the windows are short, so be ready early. I mean, a good thing about that is if the windows are driven by shipping fundamentals, uh, you guys, uh, management are always ahead of the market on, in terms of, you know, looking around the corner to those, or at least I think so. And so, you know, you, you've got some lead time to, to, to get ready. I mean, another interesting aspect is that you went public with an almost entirely new building fleet um, under yeah. construction, which is um, possible and a lot of people don't realize. So, I mean, skipping to the present, here you are, um, you're enjoying a strong market over the last, you know, year or more, um, uh, returning cash to shareholders. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm constantly distracted by my phone, letting me know that LPG is at a new all-time high. Uh, I need to mute well, that. A few weeks ago, well, a few weeks ago. It's very distracting. I, I mean, <laughs> seems like it's every day. You know, so that's that's got to be gratifying to be at that phase of your of your life cycle and having decisions like in what form do I return cash to shareholders? Um, you know, do I do I invest this cash in new capital expenditures or do I you know return a dividend or some mix? I mean, that that's where you want to be, I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, uh, shipping's obviously volatile, um, and uh, you, you know the uh, without you know, boring everybody with all the history. 2014-15 um, were great years. That's when we went public. We had a nice run. And then um, 2016 to early 2019 are what I affectionately call the nuclear winter of the LGC shipping. And uh, look, we had a huge amount of volume of, of new buildings come on, as always happens in shipping and in commodity businesses generally. Uh, took us a while to absorb uh, that order book as, a, as an industry, but the fundamentals of LPG were, were really good. And so now we're at a point in the cycle where, um, you know, the, the, the fundamental growth in the industry rates uh, were rewarding investors through improved share price performance. But as you point out, Will, um, we've been actively returning capital to shareholders via dividends since uh, 2021. And that's, um, that's really great. Um, you touched on, you know, the favorite question of every investor capital allocation. Um, we, we've sort of, uh, we've done, I'd say, uh, everything, um, you know, in, in terms of classic ways to return capital to uh, shareholders, uh, we've done open market repurchases, we've done, I don't know, 70 million or so of that. Uh, we did a self-tender offer, which Will, obviously, Will and Watson Farley advised us on, um, you know, which was an interesting exercise. 
uh, it worked out reasonably well. Uh, we ended up reducing our share count at the time by 33% from the IPO. And, a, you know, a number of our investors liked it. Um, I think that the, the weird dynamic with buybacks of, of any nature is that you're effectively rewarding exiting shareholders and management teams are fundamentally making a, a, a bet in spite of what, you know, Will, your point, yeah, we're usually ahead of the cycle, but um, unfortunately history proves we're not necessarily better equity investors than the rest of the world. And so, um, you know, you hope you're buying back cheaply. Um, I personally don't necessarily buy the old saw that whenever you're trading below NAV, you should be buying back. I'm not sure that, especially in our sector, which has doesn't have as deep a history of S&P transactions as others. You know, I think from, from our perspective where we've really seen uh, a really good result for our shareholders measured by total shareholder return has been once we pivoted to dividends. And I think it makes a lot of sense in shipping. Uh, shipping's a volatile business. Uh, you want to reward your shareholders with cash. Um, you know, I think the the benefits of a greater share of the NAV, uh, you know, which one theoretically achieves through buybacks, uh, each share thereby owning more of the NAV is a bit ephemeral. Um, you know, folks, you know, what Will wants to do with a dollar dividend and what I want to do and, you know, what, what uh, Fidelity wants to do are all fairly different things. And I think you can serve a lot of masters with that. So uh, we've done that, um, I think, with a, with a bit of a uh, more forward stance on dividends. Uh, we have prepaid some debt because we could, and you know your point. Will we uh, we we have uh, done some fleet renewal? We took delivery of one new building uh, last year, and uh, we've committed to another new building to be delivered in 2026, which will be an ammonia capable VLGC. So it's always key to strike the balance. Um, obviously, everyone loves a dividend, and uh, you know we've managed, we think, to get it so far pretty right in terms of fleet renewal because. If you don't, otherwise you've got the proverbial shrinking ice cube, but, um, you know, it's something we continue to think about and monitor and discuss intensely with as management and with our board. Yeah, I mean, there's so many aspects of that I'd love to pick at, but, you know, I, I, and, and, and discuss further, but, you know, what, one, one thing you've done that's, that's unique, I think, is just the, how well you've communicated your, I guess, your capital allocation strategy and the dividend, uh, uh, policy right i mean a lot of companies feel like they're going to be uh, if they initiate a dividend it's going to be a you know something where they give up a lot of flexibility because they're committed to it um you know you've described yours as an irregular dividend which is a somewhat unique term um yes. and that's been that's been interesting and successful and you know that's apparent and how you know and how thoughtfully you've just described it um you know, and, and I, I think you've been rewarded in terms of valuation. I mean, like you said, you spent some time in, uh, I would say, the wilderness. You said a nuclear winter. I, I mean, in terms of not just the market, but your share price valuation. And, you know, you 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 didn't do anything drastic to your, to your model. Um, uh, and you have remained a standalone company, you know, haven't merged, haven't succumbed to sort of some of the other pressures about, I mean, succumbed, but, you know, there's an argument that scale is necessary. Uh, greater scale, perhaps, is the key. That was the, you know, the, the difference. But here you've, you've sort of persisted with your, with, your, with your model that you had, had faith in. And, um, you know, I, I, I believe you've been rewarded with better valuation relative to NAV, even if that's, you know, not, not, not the be all and end all. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, you know, obviously, um, you advised us as well during our hostile takeover defense in, in 2018, um, you know, which was another sort of uh, life altering moment in any company's evolution. But I think, um, you know, fun, fundamentally the mantra from John Hajibateris, our CEO, who went public is we're going to behave like ship owners. We're not going to be driven by the flavor of the week in the capital markets. And um, we generally hewed to that. Um, you know, we've, we've tried to make decisions like ship owners. And I think uh, one of the reasons that we decided um, to stay independent, aside from the fact that it, the, the proposal was pitched at a uh, very low point in the cycle and was not very attractive to our shareholders, um, was that 
even during the pendency of that bid, um, there were four new building orders placed by uh, by charters um, because nobody, uh, no charter is going to get pushed around by an owner. And uh, from our perspective, you know, we've got to look at, we, we've got to be mindful of customers and their reactions to all these things. It's sort of a, a, a very basic principle of business. And so um, we felt the industry structure uh, was well served by, by saying the way we did. Yes, the, the capital markets logic of being a bigger company was attractive, but in our case, it would have resulted in a split listing between Oslo and Norway, and those shares aren't really fungible. And uh, we think so far we've been vindicated by our total shareholder return and shareholder volume, uh, trading volumes and, and uh, valuations, as you allude to. So, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's worked out well, but, um, you know, it's also been a good point in the cycle. So let's uh, let's hope we continue to make good decisions for the benefit of our shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and not just valuation, you're attracting institutional investment, which is something that a lot of you know, shipping companies have struggled to do. Okay. So you mentioned something of, of great topical interest because uh, the, the hostile takeover attempt, because uh, unsuccessful hostile takeover attempt, because, you know, there, as everyone I'm sure knows on this call, there are, there are multiple proxy fights, hostile, or at least unsolicited takeover uh, uh, attempts, shareholder litigation, even around these tactics. And you know, we're at Watson Farley involved in some of these, uh, where the targets are Marshall Islands incorporated shipping companies um, like Dorian. You know, and, and I think Dorian really stress tested the, uh, the, the anti-takeover uh, structures of a Marshall Islands corporation. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a perception among people considering being public or, or even currently public companies that um, th there's a real vulnerability to shareholder activism. And, you know, they look around at the environment now and, and feel quite wary. Um, but, you know, <laughs> with the benefit of hindsight, maybe I think like Dorian's an example of how this doesn't happen in one fell swoop, uh, you know, the, the takeover. And there are, there are mechanisms to, to slow things down and permit you to run a deliberate process that might not have been what it felt like, uh, you know, where you can consider shareholder issues, you can consider the offer on the table, comply with your fiduciary duties. Uh, and ideally, this allows the event not to be too disruptive of your business. Um, I, I mean, that's more of an observation than a question. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, you know, it's a concern of people. And I, I, I don't know if you have anything to say to people. I, I was oh, I was there in the foxhole with you. It wasn't. Yeah, I was going to say you were. It, it's a pretty educated uh, assessment, but no, I agree. I mean, um, look, I, I, I'd say prior to going through that experience, I generally had the view that uh, poison pills and any takeover defenses were there to uh, sort of coddle management, protect management, and actually, uh, I, I've come uh, completely around on that. Um, you do need time to uh, assess these things. I mean, from the day we, we got a bear hug offer on, you know, May 29th of 2018. And, you know, we had been working with, uh, you know, various advisors anyway, um, you know, but, but even for them to get up to speed, it takes a little while, um, you know, and, and uh, so you, you do want to be able to take your time. Uh, and I think I think that that really benefits all shareholders, right? Um, and I think it gave us time to uh, evaluate it, communicate as much as we could. I think in our case, we felt a bit hamstrung because we had to comply with all the uh, niceties that the SEC prescribes, whereas our suitor um, was not at that point listed in the U.S. and sort of had a, a better playing field, or it was an unlevel playing field, you know. Uh, they could go talk to all of our uh, all of our shareholders, um, and you know the the limitations on what they could do were not like our limitations because uh, we'll spend a lot of time cautioning us uh, along with uh, co advise us with Wachtel Lipton, and they spent a lot of time kind of talking us off the ledge at times, and uh, and and I do think those 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 defenses are good. I don't think you become uh, you know unnecessarily uh, put in play. But I still think there's an opportunity. I mean, look, I think if our suitor had actually put forth a a, a bid instead of a proposal and pitched it at a right price, um, they probably would have prevailed. Um, but uh, they didn't. And so uh, I do think the free market principles that we all like and espouse 
uh, did indeed, um, you know, um, come to fruition. So um, that's sort of a long-winded, circuitous answer, but hopefully it addressed it. Yeah, and I mean, it's a it's a it's a truly intense time, especially for management. I mean, you just alluded to, you, you know, the your your role at the sort of eye of the storm, and you have to you have to coordinate a lot of advisors and set the strategic direction. You know, the 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 board is deliberating, but you're 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 setting the day to day direction, and that's yeah. that's necessary for the advisors to help you successfully keep us all rowing together. You know, um, you know. I, I'm 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 afraid we're we're coming up on the on the end of our time. Uh, some questions came came in on the Q and A, but uh, can you believe it? They were about the topic that we just discussed. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we've addressed them. You know, thank you, Ted. That was uh, fantastic. It's always a pleasure to, to thanks, speak to Will. you. And thanks to Watson Farley for organizing this. Oh, it was great. Thank you for joining. Um, coming up next uh, is uh, my colleague, Steve Hollander, um, speaking with Anthony Argeropoulos of Seaborn Capital. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Ted. That was uh, very enlightening and uh, and interesting for those of us who uh, you know follow this type of thing. And it's it's always nice to hear from you. And uh, thanks, Will, for the introduction. So made, uh, made this easier. Um, I, I guess just to jump right into it, uh, you know, WFW, you know, we've been involved with a seemingly larger uptick of public company M&A, and we're seeing a lot more of it. D do you, and I know that Seaborn Capital Advisors does provide M&A and, and capital markets advisory services. D do you think that this trend will continue? Are you seeing a lot more of this? And, and you know, what are the what are the hurdles to overcome in, in a public M&A? Like, wh where do you think this is heading? Sure. Uh, I believe that the, um, the driver here is that uh, institutional investors want uh, larger companies with, with bigger market caps. Okay. Um, to the extent that that's something that can be achieved, uh, it's something in the right direction. Uh, so we, we will see, I believe, more public to public as well as private to public uh, M&A. Uh, I don't think that that's going to be an overriding trend going forward. And the reason being that there are several hurdles uh, to, to the process, the economics of the process, if you will. And these are obviously the valuation is a very important issue uh, where companies trade relatively to each other. Uh, the second issue is that um, we have management and founders in certain cases that may resist uh, merging with somebody else. So the issue is who's going to be the board, who's going to continue managing the company. Um, more from a technical point of view, there is the shareholder vote issue uh, for uh, American companies in particular, uh, U.S. filers, uh, the issuing more than 20% of their shares you know, requires a shareholder vote. Uh, in these cases, the vote is not so much to approve the merger, but to approve the issuance of the stock, uh, if you will, which goes hand in hand, of course, with, uh, with the merger. Uh, and the last thing that I would say is that we have very limited synergies in, um, in, in shipping. Uh, it's an industry where it's not like two banks merging with each other and eliminating a huge amount of overhead or overlapping uh, let's say branches in certain geographies, whereas um, there may be geographies where one bank is very strong uh, and present, and the other one isn't, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they can increase their, uh, their their market footprint, if you will. Shipping is different, whether we like it or not. It is a commodity business. Shipping companies, at the end of the day, for the most part, are price takers. Uh, size. Uh, matters, but it doesn't change the economics of the business, meaning you cannot drive rates if you're a bigger company. Uh, so, for example, in the Starbuck uh, Eagle merger, uh, analysts expect uh, cost savings of $50 million. Uh, that's basically, compare that with the combined EBITDA of almost $900 million, right? You're looking at synergies of between 5 and 6% or so. Uh, obviously, it's a right step. Because again, institutional investors want larger market caps. And in the dry bulk sector, uh, for example, uh, only Star Bulk and Golden Ocean will be 
we have a market cap approaching $3 billion and everybody else is um, uh, at below a billion dollars. That's it's very, it's very interesting because there's, there, there are a lot of analysts and, and when you go to, you know, all the conferences, everyone just says, you know, we, 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 there has to be bigger, bigger is better, bigger is better. But, but it's an interesting concept that, you know, at the end of the day, when you break it down on a per ship basis, there, there may not be as much cost savings as, you know, the theoretical, uh, you know, discussions, you know, may allude to. So I think the bigger or better goes to if the analysts are right. Uh, they need to have investable companies. And what do I mean by that is we all know that, uh, you know, we used, in the 80s, we used to talk about billion dollar deals. And it was, uh, you know, KKR did the first deals and it was unheard of. Uh, you know, nowadays, you're talking about billions and, you know, trillions and lar large amounts of money being managed by, by institutional investors. Uh, as a result of that, if they want to place 50, $100 million in, in, in the industry, uh, because they believe it's the right time in the cycle, uh, then they need in companies that they can actually deploy that, that amount of capital. And shipping, to the extent that public companies are not very leveraged, uh, and the companies in all the sectors are doing a great job delevering, so they have more equity and less debt, and that's the right formula. So we want to, yes, unless are right, we do want more companies uh, with market caps in excess of even $5 billion. Okay, thank you. Um, turning topics a little bit away from M&A and a little bit more towards, I guess, capital markets, although they're obviously very much intertwined. Um, you know, we understand that you help companies prepare for public offerings or private placements. Uh, what advice are you giving to companies before they go public? What is it that you want them to know in order to make their lives easier or more mm -hmm. streamlined? Okay, well, the practical aspect of it is, and I think Ted mentioned that, is prepare, be ready. And what I mean by that is not so much the prospectus, but if you um, plan to go public at any time, if it's, let, let's just say, a 30% of your options involve raising external capital, particularly in the United States, you certainly need to have PCA or B financial statements. And I know Many of my clients over the years have said, well, oh, yes, I have this accountant and our financials are fantastic and uh, our systems are very good, et cetera. And even in those cases, it has taken us uh, six months to a year to prepare the financial statements properly. So you need two years at least of uh, fully audited under PCOB standards of financial statements. I think that's something that must be done in the preparation. The second one I would say is hire a high law firm watch your parley, uh, draft a prospectus, uh, have it drafted in a relatively you know, good condition, completion level, uh, so that you can submit it confidentially or file it publicly with the SEC uh, readily and access the markets. I think that's very key. The second thing is, which is a broader question, is why do you want to go public? Uh, you have to, uh, in a sense, know what it is, or what to expect from being public, other than the public scrutiny and extra costs of uh, running a public organization. To me, uh, the, the main reasons to go public is to expand or grow your business, right? So I need external capital to, uh, to grow, possibly at times where the valuation is below this magical thing that we call NAV, which is I believe the worst crimes in shipping finance have taken place because of NAV. Um, and the second thing is the, the having a currency at an attractive valuation, at times, attractive valuation. Uh, and, and when I say attractive valuation, I don't mean below or above NAV. If your stock traded two years ago at five bucks and today trades at $50, that is attractive. I don't care where your NAV may or may not be at five or at 50. And usually at $5, you're above NAV, and at $50, you're below NAV, so go figure. The last one is the estate planning. If you have a big family and you want to leave the business as public and sustainable. Uh, and also, if you want to have the ability to exit and re-entry the sector, your own investment, your own capital, uh, 
uh, if the stock was from five to 50, using the example, you want to be able to sell your stock, but still retain control of the company and the assets, and then you can buy back the stock uh, at a later point in time. These are things you cannot do without selling the assets or buying assets uh, in a private context. Yeah, no, it's, it, these are all, all good points. And in fact, you mentioned something, uh, it's not really a question, but you know, the using the stock as currency, you know, there have been a number of transactions where stock and and notes, um, uh, publicly traded notes, have been used as consideration for ships or as partial consideration for ships. So that's just mm -hmm. an, an additional, I guess, you know, arrow or you know, quiver uh, to to help you know public companies you know overcome things that maybe uh, private companies can't. Uh, it's just a certain sure, additional course. benefit. There are wrinkles, securities law wrinkles, but things that can be overcome if necessary. Um, you know, something that we heard, uh, you know, from around the market, but do, you, but do you expect to see more public companies in the next few years? And if so, you know, more importantly, in what sectors and why? Well, the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, so there's an answer for everybody. Uh, the no, or rather in a more limited manner, I would say, goes to the larger companies that can access, do a regular way IPO. Uh, access institutional investors for the most part, and to some extent retail investors, um, and, and go public. We used, the market was open to smaller companies in the past. Uh, I believe that today you need to have a quite substantial uh, organization and, and balance sheet to access the markets in a regular way, IPO. Just to give you an idea, a small uh, initial public offering in the U.S. is in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 million dollars. Typically, you want to sell like 30 percent of the business. I mean, this is a very broad guideline, of course, uh, which means that your pre-IPO equity, uh, if you assume that you're going to go public at an AV, for example, uh, it would be something like uh, six or seven hundred million dollars. Um, there are companies out there that have you have this type of scale and balance sheet. Uh, another detriment, if you will, rather disincentive, I would say, to deciding to go public for these types of companies is that they have made so much money uh, in these good markets so that um, uh, don't think, again, that there's a particular incentive to do so, say, for estate planning or possibly retain the flexibility to sell the stock, buy the stock, and, and maintain the fleet. What we will see, though, and that's where the yes goes, is we'll see more small companies going public in non-regular way IPOs, meaning direct listings, reverse mergers, uh, spin-offs. These are going to be small companies that will access, and we'll talk about that later, um, will access the so-called structured capital, which is, you know, warrants typically, equity and warrants, units, uh, that is available to them, and actually it's the only market available to them, to raise capital and mainly grow the business. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, smaller companies, and I'll, I'll make this the final question before we turn to the Q&A, and there has, there has been a couple uh, put through. Um, you mentioned that smaller public companies um, have potential for kind of different ways to do things and, and you know, ways to go public. Um, they've also recently, uh, a lot of smaller companies have been quite active in raising equity uh, capital. Um, mm -hmm. but I would say at least in comparison to some of the larger uh, companies. Why do you think that is? Yeah, indeed. Uh, over the last, since uh, approximately, and including 2020, uh, about six or seven companies have raised almost a billion dollars, which is remarkable. Uh, why do they do that? Is because they start with two, three, four, five ships and you know are very eager to grow their, their fleets uh, substantially. The, there is no institutional interest in these companies. They're just way too small for institutions to, to participate. Uh, the only uh, way to raise capital for them is uh, through structured transactions that basically take into consideration the trading volume of, of the, uh, the stock. Uh, it's, these are type of transactions that are placed with specialized institutions that do that, not just in shipping, but in high tech, biotech, um, other, many other industries, telecoms, 
uh, healthcare. And effectively, if you look at market caps below $300 million in the United States, that's predominantly the source of capital uh, that these companies have to, uh, to, to grow effectively or to sustain, you know, if they're in a negative cash flow situation like biotech, for example, to fund their uh, business models. Okay. Well, I know we're, we're getting towards the end of, of the time we've been allotted, but let me yeah. just ask you the qu a question that's come through on the Q&A. Uh, do you think that, do you, do you think you can use U.S. capital markets to acquire new vessels and do U.S. investors take the construction risk on those vessels? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It came up a lot during our several roadshows. I would say mostly in the past um, when, when uh, there weren't that many public companies. It depends. If you are building a very unique kind of uh, FPSO with many different you know, engineering complexities, I would say yes, that they, they would be concerned about the construction risk. Uh, if you are building a tanker in Korea, uh, there is no concern about the construction risk anymore. Can you use the investors to, to, to participate in this kind of activity? Um, we have seen it, particularly in Norway, that you can raise private capital in the uh, NOTC and, and fund new buildings, just purely new buildings, I believe. Um, uh, Dorian is an example of that. Uh, in the United States in general, um, unless you have an existing public company like Scorpio was when they ordered all these uh, eco-friendly MR tankers, to go out and IPO on the basis of new buildings is quite hard because of their lack of cash flow. And the US investors are more momentum driven, earnings driven, as opposed to uh, playing the cycle or the asset uh, itself. We may see some more demand or shifting in, in this area uh, on account of the new technologies, the new uh, fuel uh, being used, uh, more eco-friendly vessels, more efficient vessels. But that, that again, I believe that's going to be quite hard. Okay. Well, thank you, Anthony. I think we have uh, hit the limit of our allotted time, so I appreciate it. And uh, of course, you're, uh, good, you're welcome. good seeing you as always. And Thank I will you. hand Thanks, it off Steve. to my, my colleague, Falana, uh, to talk to Tom. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Anthony. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for continuing to join us on this webinar. Um, I am pleased to be joined by Tom Lister, uh, Chief Commercial Officer and Head of ESG at uh, Global Ship Lease and soon to be Chief Executive Officer of the company. Um, we, we have an exciting topic, um, ESG. Uh, and certain issues and trends that public ship, shipping companies um, are now facing in, in relation to ESG. So, um, so with that, I think we should uh, just jump right in. Um, so, Tom, hi. <laughs> hi, Falana. Uh, good to see you, as always. Um, you know, there is unprecedented interest in ESG by investors, financial institutions, stakeholders, and this is all coupled with increased regulation. Um, with ESG being so broad in scope, what are some of the top ESG priorities facing the shipping industry and in particular GSM? Sure, well, thanks very much, um, Philana. Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, perhaps 30 seconds on, on GSL because all of the, the responses I will provide will be based upon the area which I know, which is container shipping and container ship owning. So GSL is a New York Stock Exchange listed company. Uh, for those who don't know it, we have a market cap of roughly 700 million. Uh, we went public um, in August of 2008 and merged with um, a, a, a Greek backed and private equity backed company called Poseidon Containers um, about five years ago. We have a fleet of 68 ships and we're tonnage providers to the container uh, liner shipping companies. So that's that's the context within which I'll, I'll try to provide a response to, to each of the questions. So interest in ESG. Um, I agree, there is, there is interest in ESG. Um, but if we break it down, although the acronym itself is, um, is comparatively new, I mean, it's only been around, I, I suppose, or at least in common use within our industry for the last five, 
years or so, but each of the elements have been around for quite a long time. So if we take things in, in reverse order, G, um, governance, well, I mean, that's key for a publicly listed company. I hope after however many years it's been, 16 years that we've been listed. Um, and with your help, Alana, we've, we're, we're getting that bit right. And, and that's the sort of the sine qua non of, of being a listed company and, and acting as stewards of other people's capital. So I don't think there's anything, you know, especially new there. Um, social, I mean, in, in our view, um, the broader and deeper talent pool in which we can uh, dip to uh, attract talent um, seems to be, you know, just good sense. So the, the more diverse our, uh, our employee base uh, and, and the more of the needs that we're meeting, uh, the more likely we are to hold on to the right people and attract the right people. So again, I think that's that's nothing especially new. Where I think things have become um, more heightened, certainly in the course of the last few years, and 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 certainly looking forward, will become uh, you know uh, e even more tightly focused is in the environmental sphere, where there's really a, a, an increasingly complex web. Of, uh, of regulations um, that we and everyone else um, in shipping need to meet going forward. The most recent appearance on, on, on the scene is from the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, EU ETS, um, which uh, the industry as a whole is getting to grips with. But given that as an industry, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking not just about container shipping here, I'm talking about all shipping sectors, given that we emit roughly 3% um, of global greenhouse gases. There is work that needs to be done here and it can genuinely uh, move the needle. So I think it's really on the environment front that both we and others, both public and private companies will be focusing especially tightly uh, you know, at, this, at this stage. Now, you know, despite the significant attention on ESG lately by, you know, by a lot of people in the public sector, private sector, like we had said, and the increased regulation, there's actually an anti-ESG movement um, mm -hmm. by the same investors, you know, who who think that companies should not care as much and, and think about ESG when implementing their business strategy. And so I'm interested to know your thoughts on how do you balance these competing views um, uh, and and what are your thoughts on the proper role of ESG uh, sure. within? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm I'm you know borrowing a, a phrase used by uh, by Ted earlier, but you know as a public company, uh, capital allocation sits always at the front of our minds, and you know we are looking after other people's money, so everything that we do, be it within the ESG sphere or anything else, it, it has to be focused on. Um, on generating value, um, you know, for shareholders through the cycle. Um, so, so that's always at the very, very um, front of our mind, and it is the lens through which we we look at um, at ESG. So, we're not looking at ESG as as some sort of crusade. I mean, clearly, it's helpful if you if you believe in the tenets of ESG. It, it helps you sort of energetically pursue those tenets, but but fundamentally, it's good, it's good business practice. It's how do we best manage risk and how do we ensure that we remain commercially viable and how do we um, ensure that we are um, in regulatory compliance and are able to continue to generate you know, um, value for shareholders through the cycle. And, and frankly, you know, again, if we go back to E, the environmental aspect, um, the regulators don't care whether we are ideologically compliant with you know the environmental regulations they just care if we're factually compliant are we meeting the requirements of of complying and i would say you know likewise um financiers you know, particularly those who are involved and signed up to the to the poseidon principles they don't care if we believe in what we're doing they just want to see us reduce um, our carbon footprint in order to help them reduce the carbon footprint associated with their loan portfolio our customers and, and here i guess 
you know, the, the liner shipping companies, because they are high profile, because they're very much consumer focused and they're under pressure from um, large retailers, um, among others, to reduce the carbon footprint of the supply chain. We have to work with them to reduce our own carbon footprint, um, which in turn contributes to their overall um, uh, sort of footprint print reducing efforts. So again, you know, if we want to be commercially relevant, we have to reduce emissions, or at least we have to help charterers, our customers reduce emissions. And I guess uh, at the end of the day, um, shareholders, some may care about the ESG element specifically, but others want to see us simply remain relevant and create value. And if it requires that we hit the right notes from an ESG perspective to remain relevant and to continue to generate value, which we think is absolutely fundamental, then that's what we'll do. So it's it's good business practice, um, Philana. There's nothing, at least as far as we see it, there's nothing ideological or, or politicized about it. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting, Tom. Um, so, you know, and, and like you said, the, the regulatory landscape is changing, stakeholder expectations are changing, your business practices are changing in response to those things so that you remain commercially relevant, as you say. What are some of the challenges in setting and achieving ESG goals in view of all of this? And, and I guess perhaps maybe on the, on the uh, emission side. Sure. Um, well, I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly easiest to pick out the challenges on, on the emissions side, but I, I would say broadly speaking, one of, one of the challenges at a more general level is that, you know, ESG is, it, it's a journey rather than a destination, at least that's how we perceive it. And it's something that all of us are sort of learning by doing um, going forward. So it's a constantly shifting or evolving set of goals. So that in itself is, is a challenge. But, but I think going back to your question specifically about um, environmental regulations, there are a whole host, well, not just the regulations, uh, but the evolving um, environmental environment, there are a host of challenges. So the first is um, the regulations themselves are changing very, very quickly and evolving very, very quickly. So in the space of uh, the last two years, the industry's had to absorb EEXI, CII, EU ETS. Next year, we're going to have to adopt um, fuel EU maritime. And I can you know, run on with, with a list of impenetrable acronyms, but I would imagine most, most people listening in have at least a sense of what they involve. But the fact is, we're moving into a, a very complex environment from a regulatory perspective and an increasingly fragmented one. I think historically, shipping has, has tended, despite the fact that we throw stones at the IMO all the time, it's actually been quite a privilege to be governed by a single regulator to, to a large extent. Now that, that environment is changing. So the EU particularly is um, forging ahead with regional uh, regulations all focused upon driving down emissions. Um, other regions, from what we understand, and countries will follow. So we're going to have to be in a position, not just us, but all, all industry players are going to have to thread a number of needles simultaneously. And that's obviously, you know, pretty, pretty complex. Um, and then I think in the background, as an industry, as a global industry, we have been operating in a, in a single standardized fuel environment in the past. And you can be fairly confident that if your vessel calls in port X or port Y or port Z, you're going to have access to fuel that will you'll be able to run your vessel on. Now we're about to, or we are in the process, frankly, of moving into a multi-fuel environment so, um, you know, some people are putting the chips uh, on green methanol as a fuel going forward, others on ammonia, um, others uh, are contemplating hydrogen. E there's even talk of nuclear, you know, and, and a couple of years ago, if I mentioned nuclear, people would think I was on the lunatic fringe, but now it's becoming increasingly mainstream as a, you know, a, a fuel that should be seriously considered for the future. So I think those are some of the challenges environmentally, 
focused challenges that we're all having to grapple with, a steady fragmentation of what used to be a standardized industry. So how do you best manage the risks and the, the, the potential opportunities that are associated with that? Yeah, um, uh, you know, and I, I think this segues nicely into the next topic I wanted to bring up is, um, you know, relevant to today. The, what's going on in the Red Sea with um, the attacks on commercial vessels and the need to reroute around, you know, the Cape of Good Hope and um, and take that detour, which then adds time, burning more fuel, more emissions. And so I'm interested to know your thoughts on what are the consequences of this rerouting on sustainability targets and increased regulations and um, and things like that? Okay. Um, well, the, the, the sort of, before we get into the regulatory impact, the, the environmental impact is undoubtedly negative. And it's negative for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, voyage distances are being extended dramatically as a result of, you know, the Red Sea and Suez being closed. And not only that, and here I'm again, I'm returning to the container shipping sector, uh, which is the one that I know. So our customers, the liner, uh, the, the liner companies operate complicated networks of services and maintaining service integrity is obviously key to the quality of service that they're providing to their customers. So if all of a sudden you put a cork in the bottleneck of one of the principal um, you know, transit channels um, that accommodates roughly 20% of global containerized trade and sucks up under normal circumstances about one third of um, global containerized fleet capacity, um, that's a big deal. And so the, the, the ships as a result are steaming much, much further to go around the Cape of Good Hope and also they've been accelerating the ships. The liner companies have been accelerating the ships to try to mitigate the impact on their service networks. And unfortunately, the relationship between speed and fuel consumption, it's, it's not linear, it's pretty much exponential or cubic. Um, and what that means is if you speed up a little bit, your, your fuel consumption goes up a lot. And so as these guys have been, number one, steaming further, and number two, speeding up their networks, fuel consumption emissions goes up astronomically. And that's going to have a knock-on uh, impact upon um, certainly CII ratings and other environmental targets for the industry as a whole. So yeah, bad news, I'm afraid, uh, in that regard. Yeah, hopefully not, not too much longer. Um, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. So, so I'd like to shift now um, to GSL specifically. Um, I know, I know the company has a robust ESG initiative, and you have your hands in in various different areas in terms of ESG. Um, you've recently announced a cooperation with the Bayes Business School to support research a research hub focused on maritime decarbonization initiatives. And um, I was hoping you can just share with us some of the details surrounding that partnership. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so Bayes, uh, listeners on the call may may be more familiar with uh, the previous sort of uh, branding of Bayes, which was Cass uh, Business School. So it's part of City Business School in in London, and a lot of certainly the Greek shipping community has passed through the master's program in shipping at uh, at Bayes, formerly Cass. So it's it's sort of well established, I would say, as a um, a seat of thought leadership. Um, within shipping. Um, Bayes itself is um, working hand in hand with the, the UK, I'm going to have to refer to my notes now, the UK National Clean Maritime Research Hub, uh, which is, you know, as the name suggests, focus on, on, on trying to improve the environmental footprint of, of shipping in the UK. But obviously, whatever you do in the UK that works in shipping can be transposed elsewhere. So the idea is that, you know, Bayes provides the clever people, the bright minds, the, the good ideas, and we, uh, Global Ship Lease, provide, I suppose, real-world experience, uh, data, 
uh, and and sort of input of that uh, of of that nature. So you know, it's a it's it's a relationship where we're very excited about, and in fact, we're we're in the process of expanding it further. Um, we hope in that we're trying to put together a um, a scholarship um, for the uh, the Bay's masters uh, in shipping program, which we focused upon supporting Greek women in, in shipping um, through that uh, program to try to, well, it goes back to the one of the earlier points I made, to try to, you know, sort of diversify what is historically rather a, a male dominated industry, increase the gender diversity, and as a result, um, materially increase the talent to which the industry in general and, and hopefully we ourselves will will have access but that's a work in progress so um, I'll, I'll keep you po- posted on that front Philana hitting, hitting on the s of the ESG yes um, yes exactly and, exactly uh, you know I, I know I know DSL is also involved in other interesting projects and and I just wanted to give you a little floor to maybe share what you find is unique uh share what you find is unique in what GSL is doing. Um, I know you're doing a lot, but maybe if you can cherry pick, you know, a few yeah. to share, because I, I do find it interesting. Sure. I mean, I, I wish I could say that we we were genuinely unique in, in what we're doing, but if I'm honest, we're not. Um, we, we try, we're, we're a small company. As I said, you know, we've got a market cap of 700 million, which is, small fry, uh, particularly in the context of the massive challenges of decarbonization. So we, we, try to, we try to be probably smart followers as opposed to you know, innovators ourselves. And given that we, we can't actually control where our ships are traded, uh, we can also not control what they're fueled with. We cannot control the risks associated with any of this. So essentially what we're doing is we're, we're retrofitting our existing ships um, to make them more efficient. We're doing that in commercial cooperation with the charters themselves, because if you make a ship more efficient, the person who's actually going to enjoy the benefits of that is the person who's paying for the fuel, and that's the charterer. So we, we do that collaboratively with, with our charterers, um, with, with them at least either picking up a six, significant slice of the tab or paying something of a premium to offset the investments in the ships that we're making. Um, we're also um, trying to harvest high-frequency data uh, from our ships. And once you have the data, um, you, we, we should be in a position to optimize the operation of those ships, again, collaboratively with, with the charterers. I mean, obviously, this is the... Uh, there's the promise of AI. We, we really don't know where that's going to lead in due course, but if you haven't got the data, you can't apply AI to it. So if we gather the data, that opens up some, some optionality, we hope. Uh, we're making our ships biofuel ready. Um, most of our ships are, are already bio, biofuel ready. We hope to complete that by the end of this year. And we've also invested um, in a carbon capture and storage venture called Aqualung. Uh, we think that's something that has tremendous promise, but I think while a lot of people, including ourselves, got very excited about it at, uh, when, when it first started to be talked about, um, the deeper you get into the weeds, the more challenging you realize it is, you know, both, both technically and economically. But if we can crack that nut collectively or, or individually, we think there's a massive prize uh, to be had there in, 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 in bridging towards a, a, a decarbonized future. Very good. Well, I, I, I think we're running up on our time and I wanted to just uh, leave a minute for Q&A. Um, we do have a question, Tom. Um, uh, okay, I'll just read it out to you. What is GSL's view on the fuel or fuels of the future? Are you waiting to see what others do or do you think you will take a relatively first mover position? Um, excellent question. And it's a question that keeps me awake at night. Um, sure. No, we will not take a first mover position. Um, I, again, I think this is where we will look to be smart and hopefully nimble followers. Uh, but, good, but because it's our customers themselves who provide the f- fuel to the ships, I would think it's going to be the liner companies themselves, our customers, who are going to be first movers in this environment because they can control where the assets are traded they can control the length of time they're traded there, and they can choose um, the fuel and propulsion technology and arrange 
um, offtake agreements with energy providers. So if they want to take a position on methanol, they can control where the assets uh, uh, are operated, control the bunkering of those assets, and control the offtake agreements from green methanol providers. So I think they will take the lead. And when when the standards begin to establish themselves, that's when we will look to follow, but we will not be first movers. Very good. All right. Well, I think that is it for us, Tom. I just want to thank you very much for joining us. And also um, Pleasure. thank you to Anthony and also to Ted and to everyone who tuned in to listen to us. Um, we appreciate it and um, wish everyone a good day. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone. Thank you.